Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. Cheers. Cheers. Welcome to Church Online and welcome from our house to yours. You know, we are so aware that 2020 was a, it was a tough year. Let's be honest about that. And, um, for many of us, we carry disappointments from, from last year and perhaps from Christmas as well. And yet there's so many things that we can be thankful to God for. And so um, today, you know, as we think back over 2020, it's not just about what we want to leave behind, but it's about what we're thankful for. And so I've been really thinking about that and very mindful that I'm really thankful for our pastoral team that my goodness, you know, this has been a really, really challenging 12 months. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bird. It's been a really challenging 12 months, but they have just pulled together. It's been very stressful, just pulled together as a team, worked really, really hard, learned a bunch of new skills. And um, I just feel so blessed by this team that we get to work with. Mm. I'm really thankful for just all the acts of kindness that have been done in the life of our church and beyond the life of our church. It really has been a hard year for many people. Uh, and yet I was so encouraged at Christmas just hearing all the stories of the acts of kindness and, uh, and you know, we shared some of those. But, um, but I'm grateful that as we step into 2020, 20, uh, 2021 that, uh, that people will continue just to be kind to one another, uh, to look out for one another and to be just very practical in the way in which they help one another. Yeah. Well, hey, today and over the next two weeks, um, we get to share some of the, the stories of mission that um, are happening from PBC. You may not know this, but 15% of all that gets given into our, our church offering, we actually give back into the work of the gospel for mi support of missionaries and organisations beyond PBC. And so today we want to share with you a latest update of Gus and Audrey, who um, are part of our PBC mission family and they're working in Taiwan. So this is what's happening for them. Hi, I'm Gus. And I'm Audrey. We're with OMF International in Taiwan. Here, OMF's focus is reaching out to working class and marginalized people because they are Taiwan's unreached. We moved to Taichung almost two years ago and I've been studying full-time learning Mandarin. I am with uh, Pearl Family Garden, which reaches out to women in the sex industry. Now my team is in Taipei, but I've been sent to Taichung to pioneer a new work here. Um, this is uh, mainly three aspects. Um, one is mobilizing, that's sharing the vision in churches, recruiting and training local volunteers. There's also street visitation, that's building relationships with women on the streets. And finally, um, discipleship, meeting women in prison, visiting them, them, them at home or elsewhere. Um, and I've also preached occasionally. Now in January, we'll begin juggling ministry in two places. We'll be moving to a nearby farming town called Po Xin to join an OMF church planting team. We'll be part of the things they do there, such as house church gatherings, one-on-one -on -one discipleship, and community work, such as running a soccer club at the local middle school. That will be half our ministry. For me, I will also continue doing the Pearl Family Garden work, traveling to Taichung two days a week. And I'll take language classes part-time and also join a Taiwanese discipleship ministry that has roots in addiction recovery. Thanks for your ongoing support and for praying for us so much. And um, please do continue to pray for us. You can pray for a good transition to life in Pushin, um, for balance and good time management as we juggle two ministries Life will be very full. And um, pray for team unity. The Pushin team is from five different countries and the team leaders will go on home assignment just as we move there. So we're doing a lot of preparations now to help us in the transition. Bye. Bye. So encouraging, isn't yeah, it? To, to hear what Gus and Audrey are up to and um, just the ways that God is using them and their flexibility as they move to Pushan. Just, um, yeah, I wanted to share with you a story. As they do move, they're going to be sharing a, a house with a, a, a guy called Kevin. And Kevin is one of the interns um, in the, the program um, that they, they've got in, um, in Pushan. And um, Kevin has undergone like such a massive transformation in the last 12 years. God has done a massive work in his life. And so we wanted to share a little of Kevin's story with you as well. Yeah. Yeah.
啊，我是在啊监狱，我听到晨曦会的弟兄来到监狱来做一个生命的一个见证分享。啊，那当时我是在啊坐在下面，我是受刑人。吸了又后悔，喝了又后悔，可是后悔没多久，又同样去做一件事情，那同这是等于说是毫无盼望嘛，让我一直找不到一个出路。结果那天我听完见证，我觉得自己应该到晨曦会去啊，去认识一下。He's very proactive to visit other、uh, men. Some of these men, maybe their wives and their kids, are already coming to our Sunday service. But the husbands rarely came. But until this intern came, one of the biggest joy of having an intern with me is to have a local Christian as my teammate. Local Christians are very important because they know the local culture. And this particular intern, he was a very hard-hearted non-Christian beforehand, and we have the privilege to see him a total transformation. We see the fruits of a ten-year progress, and that means he understands the local.、Um, Non-Christians a lot more, and his presence just reminds me when I see other non-Christian men in my ministry making no progress for the last three years. I can say, well, my intent is real proof that God changes people, even when we see no progress for this many years. Ah, 更重要的是说啊一些陪伴的工作。我觉得这在晨曦问也是很重要的一环。我们要如何去陪伴一个啊，从未信啊到可以愿意打开心门接受耶稣的，然后从可能一个不好的境况中哦，可以因着信仰，也可以啊有盼望，然后渐渐的走出那个不好的情况中。我觉得啊，这个。也是晨曦会期望在做的一件事情，所以说我觉得每个学员若能来到这实习，我觉得都是非常棒的一件事情。That is such an encouraging story, isn't it? Well, just a couple of things before we move on with the service.、Uh, firstly, tell us about the women's retreat. You're going to do it a little bit different this year. We are, we are. So just because things are a little up in the air, we want to.、Um, Do our retreat in homes. It's going to be a little bit different, but really, really fun. And、um, we're just really hoping to build on some of the friendships and good things that happened as we met in homes last year. So the 20th of March. Put the date aside, ladies and gals.、Um, we're going to gather, and、um, it's going to be so, so good. Yeah. And something else different over the next three weeks. We、uh, have a good friend of ours. His name is Scott Morrison. Not that Scott Morrison, but Scott Morrison, who's the pastor at Georgia's River Life Church. He's going to be sharing with us、um, out of a series on discipleship, and、uh, we've had a look at it already. I'm really encouraged by it, and I think that what he has to say, but also the questions that come out of it for us to think about, reflect on, and to discuss, will be really, really helpful. So, I just really want to thank Scott for sharing this with us,、uh, and really trust that you'll enjoy just his input this week and over the next three weeks. That's all for the moment, and、uh, we'll come back and talk with you at the end of this. God bless.
done great things. And break every chain, oh God, you have done great.
Hey Parramatta Baptist, Happy New Year! I'm Scott Morrison from Jordan's River Life Church and it's an honour to be asked by my friend Steve and Kathy to join you for a few Sundays this month to share some of the messages that we filmed at Jordan's River Life Church in 2020 during you know what. Uh, these were part of our Love Moves series as we worked our way through the book of Acts. And there are a bunch of others that can be found on our YouTube channel as well. They were intentionally filmed kind of shorter and for a broader audience. So if you think it's relevant to someone considering perhaps faith in Jesus, please be bold and share it with them. As we all look to a new year with new possibilities, I hope today's message really challenges you wherever you're at, to see or, or maybe see for the first time how the good news of Jesus radically changes the way that we understand and live out our lives. In the message today, I'll invite Jordan's River to connect with me, but I want to invite you to connect with Steve and Kathy and the team at Parabaps via the link below or at admin at paramatabaptist.com. Well, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you're challenged by this message. Thank you so much. May God bless you and Parramatta Baptist in 2021. See you later. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to the meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. There is a, a sad old tinny tangled in the mangroves just down from here, which I've been paddling past for months. I was thinking, I'm going to salvage this. And also because, uh, well, if it comes loose, it would be really dangerous hazard in the river. So the other morning I'm paddling by and I noticed that it's broken loose and one more high tide and it would be floating away. So it was sort of like now or never. So I clambered out of my kayak into the mangroves, upended it and got maybe half the water out of it. And then I had this short piece of rope, which I tied it uh, to my kayak, imagining that I could just paddle back home and secure it there. What I didn't really think through, however, was the weight of a half submerged boat, nor the speed of the tide. So here I am paddling with all my might, looking pretty silly. The neighbors are probably laughing at me, realizing that it, it really wasn't working. I wasn't moving the boat, the boat was moving me, or more accurately, the tide was moving us both in the wrong direction. It was like uh, this tinny didn't want to be rescued. And things went from bad to worse when the knot came loose uh, and the boat starts drifting away on the tide. So as a last resort, I use my kayak as a battering ram and eventually push it back into the mangroves where it still sits today. I might try and rescue it again, but I probably won't use a kayak as the rescue vehicle next time. And I got to thinking that our lives are a bit like this picture. The, the tinny is 
are our different attachments and pursuits and dreams in life, the things that we must have, that we must hold on to. The tide is the unrelenting pull of the culture that we are in. And we are like the helpless kayaker, either paddling freely regardless of the cultural tide or weighed down and dragged along with it and all of our attachments. And as I, I look at Athens in Acts chapter 17, I see that what Paul observed was a tide of idols and ideas, a city of people with strong attachments to religion and reason. It's as if it was written for you and I today, which it was. And I think you and I can find ourselves in this story. And it certainly raises the question, are you free? Or is the prevailing culture taking you and your attachments where it wants to go? Late last year, Jody and I visited Athens together and I got to stand in the very place where Paul spoke these words. And I'd have to say that Athens is well and truly past its glory days. It looked pretty tired and run down. And in AD 50, when this was written, it was also past its glory days by about 300 years. That said, Athens was still a great city to visit as it was in Paul's time when it was the center of worship and philosophy and education and art and technology and culture. But Paul is a tourist in an amazing city, just like we were. And, and I do hope that the traffic was better for him because it's a nightmare these days. Now, as his custom, we read that he goes to the synagogue and then to the marketplace, and then he's either invited or possibly required to speak at the Areopagus, which is kind of like center court for the Athenian pastime of philosophical debate and law, where Athens intellectuals and the elite would congregate. What did Paul find in Athens? Well, he found a fast flowing tide of idols and ideas. This week, let's look at the idols. And next week, let's look at the ideas. From just about everywhere in Athens, you can see the famous Acropolis. The, the centerpiece being the, the, the Parthenon and the temple of the goddess Athena. By Paul's day, it was 500 years old, but the mythology was much older. And the mythology of Greece was a world of gods who controlled sky and earth and water and war and love and art and fertility. In fact, every aspect of mortal life. Like Athena, these gods were revered and prayed to in the pursuit of the good life. In Athens, the gods were big business with temples or shrines in every corner and in every home. Belief in the gods was the only socially acceptable path. It was the tide. And atheists, well, they couldn't be trusted to honor agreements or conduct business. So it wasn't really cool to be an atheist. And as I said last week, this kind of transactional way of, uh, of relating to God or the God seems to be hardwired into our hearts. Not just in ancient history, we sacrifice to all sorts of idols for some gain today. You might say, no, I don't. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, be caught dead sacrificing anything to anyone. Okay, so maybe you don't pay for a fluffy four-legged creature to be disemboweled or offer prayers or incense before a glistening marble statue. We're far too humane, much too sophisticated for that. But I wonder if we have just swapped the name tags on the idols. Let me give you some examples. For example, the Greek god Adonis was the god of beauty and desirability. Now, getting an enviable body is a multi-billion dollar industry that people become obsessed with attaining. The fitness industry is worth two and a half billion dollars in Australia per annum. The cosmetic industry, six and a half billion dollars, and another billion for the cosmetic surgery industry. That's $10 billion a year in Australia on looking good. I think you could say that that's being high maintenance. Or Aphrodite was the god of love. People make great sacrifices and compromises in order to find love or a partner. Or Eros, the god of sex. Hello, I mean, estimates of up to 30% of all internet traffic is porn related. And three out of the top 10 sites visited in the US are porn sites. 
Or Plutus, who was the god of prosperity. People make massive sacrifices for a certain address or designer brand or lifestyle to impress. Or Apollo, the god of art and music and divination. I mean, how people worship their celebrities and their social influences. Or Ceresus, I think that's how it's pronounced, the god of chance. You know, Australians gamble nearly $250 billion a year. Or Dionysius, the god of wine and partying. Aussies spend $14 billion a year in the bottle shop. I, I think you're probably getting my point. We, we still have the same idols. We just don't carve them from marble anymore. Rather, we post them on our Instagram and call them self-improvement or hashtag living my best life. I might be showing my age, but as Bob Dylan sung, you are going to have to serve somebody. And friends, everybody is worshipping something or someone, something that if they lost it, they would be devastated. Maybe it's your career or your home or your family. Maybe it's your attractiveness. Maybe it's your abilities. Listen, there is nothing wrong with valuing these things. They are good, but they become idols when, as Tim Keller puts it, they get elevated from being good things to being ultimate things. When we promote them to the place of being our source of our identity and our meaning, and that our life would feel like, well, it's over without them. This is the tide of our world, friends. And under every person and under every community and every culture are powerful idols driving us. The challenge for us all is who will we serve today? Because you're already putting your faith in something or someone. Paul saw all this and it says that he was greatly distressed because as his argument goes from verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and doesn't live in temples built by human hands. And he goes on in verse 29 to say, almost that you're missing the point. He says, uh, and do not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone or an image made by human design and skill. See, Paul's looking and, and he's seeing that people are so immersed in the culture, so weighed down with attachments that they don't even realize that they are totally invested into an assortment of man-made counterfeits, frankly, that neither satisfy them nor save them. And all their devotion and all their religious activity was misplaced, as can ours be. Just as Paul walked the streets of Athens with fresh eyes, maybe today you need fresh eyes to see what's driving you. Uh, what are you so attached to that you are terrified to lose? Can you see any idols in your life? Can you see that they promise much more than they can ever deliver? Look, it may be terribly hard to answer this because our idols appear so normal in the culture around us which is why we actually need God's revelation and we need other people to be honest with us. I mean, who can tell us that our workaholism or our fitness obsession or our drinking habits or whatever it is, whatever attachment is dragging us away from the life we most want? What if you could exchange all those idols, all those substitutes for real hope and real satisfaction? You know, when the rope came loose on the tinny, the fact is I was free to pedal. It was a mercy to lose the weight, to let it go. I didn't need it anyway. And I pray today that you may hold loosely to all the good things of your life and discover that your best life happens when we say yes to Jesus and give him our affection and our surrender, that there is freedom for you today in and through Jesus. If you'd like to talk to me about faith or connect with us at GRLC, we would love to hear from you. And you can contact me at care at grlc.org.au. Hey, thanks for joining me. Would you pray with me this moment? 
Jesus, I thank you that uh, you're the real thing and that uh, where all of our substitutes may be good, um, you are great and you can satisfy and you can save in a way that nothing else can. Pray that each one of us listening to this today, maybe for the first time, would recognize that everything else doesn't stack up and that you are the answer to all their hopes and all their dreams. And I pray, Jesus, that we might choose you and learn what it means to worship you with our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining me again. God bless. See you next week. Thanks, Scott, so much for sharing that with us. I'm really looking forward to the next two instalments of this sermon series that you're sharing with us. Just a couple of things I'd love just to share with you. Uh, firstly, our e-newsletter is the best way to receive all the information about what is happening in the life of the church. It goes out each Friday, and this coming Friday, uh, it will resume again on the 8th of January. So if you're not signed up to that, shoot us an email and we will hook you into our e-newsletter. The other thing too is if you have been watching us, uh, we would love for you to make contact with us. Uh, we would love just to know who you are uh, and if there's any way in which we can help you in terms of understanding the Bible, knowing more about the Christian faith, or just to have a conversation, we would love for you to be in contact with us. Or chatting through anything that's come out of Scott's sermon today as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Hey, we do want to say thank you to everyone who contributes financially for the work of the gospel through PBC. We um, are really grateful. Your giving is very much needed and um, we know it's an act of worship to God as well. If you're new to PBC and you're yet to um, commence giving, there are details for how you can do that um, on our website and um, also in our e-newsletter as well. So bless you and have an awesome week. We pray that you're able to kick back and have a little bit of rest as, um, as we just settle into January. Mm, yeah, go bless you. Thanks, Scott, so much for sharing that with us, and we're looking. There's a truck. <laughs> From our busy road to yours. Can we keep the birds in it? That was great. <laughs> <laughs>